Okay. Welcome everybody to this uh, short presentation on, on trees and ghouls. We're going to try and explore what I think is this kind of amazing relationship we get between animals and plants that um, just produce these kind of weird relationships. And uh, if you don't know much about ghouls, uh, then I think prepare to be amazed because they are, you know, pretty, pretty cool things. Um, before we kind of get into that, um, I'm going to just ask Ness to say a few words because this whole program um, of which this talk tonight is part of is uh, is supported by the City Council and particularly the Serving the Saffron Brook project. So, Nesta, do you want to say a few words, explain what it's about? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so the Saving the Saffron Brook project is a partnership. So we're led by the City Council. I'm an em uh, employee of the City Council, uh, but we're partnering with it would be in Wigston Borough Council uh, with Nature Spot, uh, who Dave is representing today, and other local groups. Um, and we are we're, we're a sort of two pronged project. We're a, an ecological project restoring the Saffron Brook, which some people know as the Wash Brook as well. So it runs from Oadby and right through Leicester and joins the River Saw. Um, and we see that as a, a nature corridor that can link up green spaces right from rural OB right into the city centre. Um, and so we've identified some key sites along there where we can work to improve habitat and ecology within the river and improve habitats and ecologies alongside the river as well and connect them up. Um, so that, that piece of work is ongoing. Um, plans are being developed um, in Knighton Park, in, Hewenden Drive, which is right down near Saffron Lane, near the sort of confluence of the river and up in Oadby, uh, in the golf course as well, that's up there next to Knighton Park. So we've got a few, a few different sort of infrastructure projects going on. And then at the same time, we've been running, as Dave said, a programme of talks. And then each, each of these um, ID courses that we're doing online are paired with a, a field visit as well so hopefully if some of you haven't signed up to come along on Saturday then you'll uh, be persuaded too by the end of this evening um, and we've also put on children's play days getting kids to come and play in the brook and learn about all the creatures living there and we've put on mindfulness sessions we're running volunteer sessions so there's lots going on to kind of connect people to the nature and the natural world that is right here in the city um, and we've got some I'll put I'll put a link to our website in the chat so if everyone wants to see that if you keep checking the events program we're we're updating it all the time so we've got some things coming up in half term that we need to put on there the October half term and um, beyond that we'll be doing things like tree planting at the golf course uh, into December we'll be making wreaths from holly that we can cut from the spinney in Knighton Park so there's a there's all sorts going on there's lots of ways to get involved as well as coming to talks like this cool thanks Dave okay lovely thanks Nesta so um just to uh, make a bit of a plug really for a project that we're running in partnership with Serving the Saffron Brook um we've launched this um this bit of fun really it's a it's a challenge to to anybody that is interested in wildlife to uh, see if you can identify a hundred different species and uh, we'll give you lots of support and help to do it and you get a certificate if you if you manage to do it at the end of it so um it's it's a great way actually to kind of incentivize yourself to to kind of delve a little bit deeper into all types of wildlife and, and learn to put names to, to to more different species it's free to sign up you can just uh, visit nature spot and you can get more information just as um, kind of a, a background resource to help you on your way in terms of identifying things, um, as well as signing up for uh, the 100 Species Challenge, um, where you will get different versions of these reports with a little bit more kind of ID help in them. Um, but you can, at the moment, just go and download any of these uh, Leicestershire Wildlife Guides, of which there's over 20, and you can get them from uh, the NetSpot website. And there's a couple I just wanted just to flag up tonight um, that, that you might be relevant. We haven't got one on goals, I'm afraid, but we do have one on uh, trees. 
uh, commentaries and another one, a related one on hedgerow trees and shrubs. And as I'm going to say in a, in a little while, um, getting to know the species of tree and shrubs takes you a long way to learning what type of gall it is you're, you're looking at and this close relationship there. So uh, just a kind of couple of pointers about uh, how you might go about identifying trees, what resources you need. Um, the, there's lots and lots of books out there. Um, so this is not the only one by any means, but it is quite a useful one. Um, it's a photographic guide. Some people prefer photographic guides, some people prefer illustrated guides, and there's pros and cons with both of them. Um, if you don't want to buy that, then I uh, just point you towards the tree gallery on Nature Spot, which exclusively provides uh, photographs and ID information on all of the tree species that you're going to find in Leicestershire and Rutland. We only cover the species that you find locally. So that can help to narrow down the choice. Um, also, you might be interested in, in, the, in uh, using an app on your mobile phone. The Woodland Trust offer one, which is uh, is quite good. It will take you through a step-by-step -step approach to identifying a tree. Um, one I like, um, which is not just for trees, it's for all kinds of wildlife, is called Obs Identify. It's been produced in, uh, in the Netherlands. It's really good um, and it's you can download it for free. And one that if you've got um, an Android phone that you've already got built into your phone is Google Lens. If um, you take a picture um, and then go to the gallery, it's always an option to use Google Lens to analyze the picture. And it can be helpful about giving you an idea of what, what you've got. With all of these apps, you can't rely on them 100%. But um, you know, if you don't really know what it is uh, and you want some pointers, then they can be useful. And the other thing, just to flag up, which is always useful for all sorts of wildlife, but, uh, but particularly for, for trees and plants, um, is, is a hand lens. Um, it just allows you to kind of walk around with a little mini microscope in your pocket. It's dead useful and they're very inexpensive. Now, as far as goals themselves are concerned, uh, the book on the left, I couldn't recommend more highly. It's a brilliant little book. Uh, it's not expensive and it covers nearly all of the common goals. Um, so I'm sure you'll be queuing up to buy it by the end of, uh, of the session today. Um, again, you can go to the Nature Sport Galleries. We've got a, a section on goals, uh, again, with photographs, um, just a selection here of all of the species that uh, you're likely to find in Leicestershire and Rutland. Um, the British Plant Goal Society has its own website. And uh, that's also got lots of information and uh, a useful place to start if you get more into it. And again, you can use the Obs Identify app to help you identify goals. So let's uh, ask a question, well, what is a goal? Um, it's a very strange uh, natural phenomenon that we see on trees. And it's kind of, in a way hard to explain what it is. Uh, it's certainly an abnormal growth. It's, it's the plant itself that produces the gall, but it's tricked into creating that structure normally by, by an animal. It can be a fungus, but uh, it's normally it's a, it's a different organism of some kind. And what it does, it basically takes control of uh, the, the plant cells and uh, it, it actually changes the genetic code such that the, the plant produces this, um, th this odd growth. So it's a bit like, a, I suppose, a benign tumor. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't do the plant any particular harm, um, but so what you see as a gall is actually the plant tissue, albeit within that gall, you will find um, the, the young of the organism that caused it. So basically the, the animal or whatever is kind of creating uh, a little nursery cell for its young. Um, so what causes galls? Well, all manner of different uh, types of things. Uh, I mentioned some are fungi, but majority are invertebrates of one kind or another. All different types of, uh, of, of insects and other invertebrates, so aphids or green fly. Not all of them create, create uh, galls, but some of them do. Um, there's, a, there's a whole manner of, of, of different mites. And these are so small, um, less than 
a half a millimeter virtually invisible to the human eye so it's a good example of where actually the gall which is much more obvious tells us that these species are around which you wouldn't otherwise know um psyllids um are a form of a bug one of the the true bugs you know with these sucking mouth parts um gall midges gall flies etc so they they are just types of flies um but the the, the specific species that uh, trigger the gall formation now many of these are really small and as we'll see in a minute so are, are, are most of the gall wasps and indeed some of the sawflies um so as i say it's often the galls which is is their presence which tells you they're around we wouldn't otherwise know so i'll uh, just talk very briefly about some of the uh, the mechanism for, for how galls are caused because it's actually quite fascinating so what triggers it so it started by the female insect or, or, or whatever um, normally the insect um, when the female lays her eggs on the plant um, the she'll also kind of inject a kind of a chemical and that chemical then triggers changes within the plant and then that whole process is continued by the larva that are developing uh, as a, a, from those eggs also releasing chemicals changing the plant chemistry um, so a lot of the research has been done specifically on gall wasps and we're going to focus on gall wasps in a minute because they create some of the the, the more obvious and spectacular galls um, but it's been found through research that there is a modification of the genetics of the plant uh, in the specific case that there was looked at in this research they reckon it changed up to a third of the of the oak's genome which is pretty amazing so in terms of what what we should be thinking a gall is um it, it is a kind of um, a different kind of organ it's a it's a different structure but it's a very predictable structure the same the same kind of um shape very recognizable shape appears every time on the, on that plant when it's triggered by the animal and where would you find a gall well pretty much anywhere on the plant they can occur um many are on the leaves sometimes and in the stems quite a lot are in the roots they tend to be invisible to us because we, we we don't see them sometimes in the flowers sometimes in the seeds so really any part of of the plant can be affected and just to emphasize that when it comes to trying to work out what gall it is that you're looking at you really do need to understand uh, or, or be able to identify the plant and once you've got the the plant id then it tells you or narrows down the the id choice for the gall and vice versa because there's a very specific relationship going on and this is because of this kind of chemical pairing um the individual insects create um you know, develop these kind of chemicals that are designed specifically to change the uh, the chemistry of that particular plant and so they are bound in that kind of close partnership it's not necessarily always one species it can be a group of very closely related species for example as we'll look at in a minute um the cynipid wasps uh, as they're looking at here uh, quite commonly cause galls on oaks but it's not just the kind of common english oak it can be other oaks as well but only on the oaks largely so yeah you look at this uh, this what it's not probably the kind of wasp that you had in mind uh, or most people have in mind when you when you mention wasps there's all some, all types of different um of wasps in, in different um, families and the cynipede is one of the wasp families uh, that particularly um are specialized in in creating galls and so looked at close up like this they're quite spectacular the only trouble is they're pretty small and so you don't actually see them very often as an adult they're just they go under the radar they're too small um so using the the tracks and signs of many of these small or cryptic species um and and the gold is a is a sign of their presence so it actually is sufficient evidence for us to be able to identify and record that that species is present so that's how we know how widespread these things are not because we've seen the adults or the larva for that matter but we've seen the galls
So um, let's just have a quick look at um, the kind of life cycle, particularly the one of these cynipid wasps, as it has a particularly interesting life cycle. So we'll start in this circle with, with B, which is the, the female landing on the host plant, laying its eggs, injecting the chemical, as we've said, and a result of that, the gall starts to form. It forms around the larva that are hatched out from the eggs. So basically, it's creating a, a capsule with that gives protection to the larva, and also the tissue that's building up within the gall provides food for the larva. So you know they have it quite nicely, really. They've got you know a nice home to live in, provided with food and shelter, largely protected from from many predators, but not all of them as we'll see in a while. Um, but th this isn't true of all galls, but it is generally true of these cynipid wasps, that they have two generations in the year. And the first generation that hatches out from the galls that we tend to see um, are only females that hatch out. Uh, so it's called a, a, an agamic or asexual generation. So those females then fly off and they lay their eggs using or through a process called parthenogenesis where they're not, they ha those eggs haven't been fertilized uh, by, a, by a male. Um, they lay those eggs onto a, often a different plant and a different gall forms. And quite often this secondary gall is on the roots of a plant or it, they're often harder to find than the, the, the early generation galls. Um, and then the, uh, the males and the females hatch out from the secondary gall mate and then we're back to where we started with the female going off to, to lay her eggs um, so quite clever I, I, this isn't um, actually a, a british species but i thought it was quite interesting to illustrate um what, what's going on so it, this is a snippet wasp it lays its eggs into um a, a twig or, or, or and the capsule uh, the gall if you like forms within the twig and uh and then what is, is happening is actually kind of parasitized by um, another wasp who lays its egg inside the same chamber. And then what is the amazing thing is that it uh, affects not just the chemistry of the plant, but it affects the chemistry and behavior of the first wasp. So what happens is when the first wasp hatches out, that um, it starts to crawl through out of the little exit hole and it, well it has to gnaw its way out the exit hole um because the the predatory wasp larva doesn't have the ability to gnaw its own way out so it lets the first wasp create the exit hole but then the behavior changes so it stops with its head sticking out and uh, and dies basically and then the predatory wasp hatches out and it uses the body of the first wasp as its tunnel to get out and uh, it emerges through the head of the of the first wasp and it, it stimulated the research because they kept finding these wasp heads sticking out of these bits of wood with massive holes in them and they didn't work couldn't work out for a while what was going on so it's uh, all part of the weird and wonderful stories that we see in nature so we're going to have a look at um, a number of trees and look at the galls that you find on them and uh, we're going to do look at quite a few that you find on oaks because they are the tree species that supports more galls than any other. Uh, and it is useful to know which um, type of oak you're looking at. So there are several oaks that you could come across. So starting in the top left, uh, this is the English oak or peduncular oak. Uh, it's called peduncular oak. Uh, peduncle means kind of dangling. Uh, it's because the acorns uh, are dangling on a stem. The, uh, in contrast to that, the other oak, native oak that we get in Leicestershire is the sessile oak. This is more uh, an upland oak, you find it in the Charnwood Hills. Sessile means without a stalk. So the acorns here grow directly out of the twig without the stalk. So they're quite easy to identify. The leaves also can uh, give you uh, an ID feature. The leaves of peduncular oak um, are, are largely stalkless, whereas sessile oak um, they have short stalks, so the opposite really of, of what we're looking at with the with the acorn. So many of the galls um, can produce, or the gall causing insects, and these these wasps in particular can 
can cause galls on both uh, plants, both these, these, these tree plants. Uh, another kind of fairly common oak that we that we come across is the turkey oak. And what's interesting is that some of the wasps use the turkey oak as their secondary host. Um, and then a third oak, oh, sorry, fourth oak that we sometimes see uh, in, in particular in woodlands is the red oak. This has got really large leaves, um, bigger than your hand. Um, so if you see leaves of that size, it's probably a, a red oak. So let's look at some of the uh, amazing uh, galls that we can find on on the on these three species, particularly on, on the oaks. So the most obvious one, probably, and it's quite obvious this time of year, is the is the nopper gall, um, which affects the acorns. I mentioned earlier that the galls can appear on all different parts of the plants depending on the gall, um, but nopper galls specifically. Uh, grow on top of the acorn. It's where the female uh, wasp, as you can see on the right there, has laid her eggs. And it causes this kind of really weird um, mutated tissue to grow on top of the acorn. It looks, I always think it looks a bit like a molten wax, wax has been poured on top of the acorn. Um, sometimes you come across trees that nearly every acorn is affected. So it must have some impact on the tree uh, long term. But normally they, they produce so many seeds that they, they're expecting only a few of them to actually succeed in, in germinating into, into new trees. So there's, there's, there's the room for spare, uh, spares that can be given over to predators, uh, uh, which are effectively what the gall wasps are. Interestingly, this um, gall wasp only arrived in, in Britain in the 1960s. So it's uh, it's only been around, what, 40 years? And it's so common, almost every oak tree uh, will, will have these, these galls on them. Another one that um, is really obvious, again, you'll find it on nearly every oak tree. You have to turn over the leaf, and on the underside of the leaf, you have these spangle galls, look like little mini flying saucers. Um, and often you can get hundreds, if not thousands, on the leaf. Sometimes there's so many on the leaf, you can't see the leaf. You just get lots of these little overlapping galls. And the, um, the, the second generation, sexual gen generation, um, is often on the same tree, but it affects a different part of it. It's on the catkins. And it produces these, what are called pea galls, these little round um, blobs that you can see on the picture on the right. Another one that's very common on the underside of oak leaves, um, really quite pretty little gall, the uh, silk button gall. You can see why it's called a silk button gall wasp. They're quite small, um, but again, there can be hundreds and thousands on a single leaf. And uh, in, in many cases, the, the, the gall develops on the leaf and the gall falls when the leaf is shed in the autumn. And it carries on developing within the gall, protected within the leaf litter uh, down at the base, and then it hatches out in the spring and forms the, the sexual generation. Um, so the, it's one of the reasons, because the first generation, um, the sexual generation happens really early in the year, and the galls are often harder to find, that we don't notice them. It's only the, uh, the, the asexual generation that happens um, later in the year that, that we, we come across the galls. And two more, which uh, we should be able to find um, on oak trees, uh, the artichoke gall on the left and the kola nut gall on the right. All of these that we've looked at so far are caused by, by these uh, cynipid wasps. Um, again, really tiny things, so we can't see them. Um, the other interesting thing with galls is that, um, particularly these uh, galls, they're, they're quite hard and woody on the outside. Obviously, they, they're softer on the inside because that's the uh, the soft tissue that the the larva of the wasp are feeding on. Uh, but they will often persist then over the winter, so you can often find them when all the leaves have fallen. In fact, sometimes it's easier to find them then because they're not hidden by the leaves. And uh, so it's worth having a look in in winter, uh, particularly on, on oak trees for for, for for these types of galls. And one that uh, you definitely can find in, indeed 
it, it, the, the old galls can last for a long, long time. Um, a fresh marble gall um, is about two centimeters across and has a kind of a, you know, a ready orange color. And then once the wasp larvae have developed and emerged, they gnaw their way out. And you can see the little exit hole in the top right hand picture there. And then the gall will, the old gall will just stay attached to the twig for, for 12 months or so. So you often, as I say, can find them in the winter. Um, so you, you kind of get an idea of these kind of snippet wasps. They've got a big fat body and a stunted little head, but they're only, you know, a couple of millimeters long. So they're, they're, they're hard to see. Now, what's interesting about the marble uh, gall itself is that it has a, a commercial value. It's been used for uh, thousands of years across the world um, as a source of ink. And you can actually buy them online. This was, um, I just Googled it out of interest, and uh, this, this came up. So you can go and buy um, you know, 20 goals for £10. Or you can come along on Saturday and collect your own for nothing. Um, and what they do is they soak them in water. And um, and then they mix that uh, that solution. I think it's with some kind of is it iron sulfate or with a chemical compound, and it brings out the dye in the solution. And they can use that as an ink. And traditionally, it's been used as an ink for, uh, as I say, thousands of years. The uh, Black Sea Scrolls um, were written using uh, ink from from the, the the, the marble uh, gall. Although interestingly, um, it doesn't last over time, it fades quite badly. So if you want to write something that you want to last the next 2000 years, probably best to find a different ink. So let's change species now. Um, but I'm just focusing on the commonest galls on the whole that we likely to find, or you can e easily find if you go searching. So this is blackthorn, um, co common shrub in many of our hedgerows. So this time of year, if you go and look at the leaves and look closely at the edges of the leaves, you'll see these little, um, little bubbly blisters on the edge of the leaf on the left here. So these are caused by a mite. Mite are related to spiders. They're, they're small arachnids. And as I mentioned a while ago, they are so small they're virtually invisible to the human eye. Um, but each of those little bubbles that you can see there, those blisters, um, is hollow on the inside. And normally on the underside of the leaf, there's a little hole um, which allows uh, the kind of entrance and exit into that chamber. And the mites can come in and in and out. Um, so they can, will come out, particularly at night, to, to feed um, on the wider leaf, and then they go back in where they've got some protection. And then they overwinter normally uh, by crawling into the kind of crevices in the bark of the tree. And so um, they, they're ready to emerge next spring when the leaves unfold. Another gall which isn't so common, but is one that's worth looking out for on blackthorn, is one that's uh, called the pocket plum. It actually affects the, the fruit, the slows of buckthorn and causes them to to kind of bloat and turn into these uh, very strange um, fruit-like um, shapes. Uh, they start off kind of greeny yellow, and then they will turn red, and, and often they will turn turn uh, towards black as they as they age. But you know, often you see them in groups, like like you can see on this picture. So it's quite quite a, a striking thing to find. Dog rose, um, another uh, common plant that uh, you, you, you'll find in hedgerows and, and scrubby areas. The uh, the gall on the left is is pretty common and is an amazingly uh, spectacular gall. Um, it's officially called the Bedegar gall, but it's also often referred to as the robin's pincushion. So it has this kind of hairy red mass of, of fibers. It can be quite big, golf ball size. And um, you often again see them that when they're, they're aged, uh, once the winter comes, 
it loses its red color and they go um they, they lose some of the the um the threads as well so they become more compact look quite bedraggled and they turn brown but uh, they're still fairly obvious particularly in winter when there's no leaves and even when they're looking brown they can still be occupied uh, by a range of, of, of creatures and we'll, we'll come back to that in just a minute but another amazing looking little goal is this one on the right the, the Sputnik goal called after they got a Russian satellite that was quite a spiky looking thing um, these are a little bit harder to see but uh, again quite spectacular if you if you can come across them this is quite small in in, in relation to the the uh, the better gargoyles you have to look more closely to find it so just kind of coming back to the the better goal, goal. so um it's caused by uh, our friend one of the cynipid wasps um this time um it has this really strange ovipositor here that kind of uh, angles out from beneath its abdomen which it uses to stick into the rose and uh, and that's what the wasp uses to to inject its its eggs and, and, the, and the chemicals to to stimulate the start of the of the gall so it creates this gall as we can see on the left um for all of its babies and you think great it's got a lovely house a nice nursery um that's the end of the story, except it's not, because once the gall has been formed, then other wasps think, oh, that looks a nice home. They haven't got the ability to create the gall themselves, but they can basically squat. So they, they move in. And uh, so you get a whole range of different uh, other wasp species living in the gall that don't cause it, and they don't predate or affect the the gall causer but they just share its home and these are referred to as inquilines but then you get the predators uh, or the parasitoids as they refer to these are normally more wasps um, again very tiny looking things um, but they often have a really long um, ovipositor this is the uh, the structure at the end of the abdomen that the female uses to lay the eggs because she has to be able to push that deep into the gall um, often they have uh, quite a sharp end because it has to pierce quite tough tissue. And what they're, she's trying to do is she's trying to detect the, the larva. And it could be either the gall causer or the inquiline. She's not bothered. Uh, and she'll lay her eggs um, against those larva. So the eggs hatch and they will feed on the, on the larva. And the story doesn't actually end there. Uh, the parasitoid wasps are also parasitize themselves so you get this whole chain of succession and with a bedigar gall uh, there's been quite a few studies done on it uh, you can they have found up to to 20 species i i this is an experiment a few years ago i uh, i took one of these old galls that i found um, when i was out walking on a i found it on a, on a, an old dog rose and popped it in a jar and just put it on the shelf and kind of forgot about it and then uh, I think this was in the autumn and then the next spring I had to look in the jar and there was all these little tiny specks on the bottom of the jar so I got to, got out my lens and looked at them closely and it was full of all of these little tiny wasps um not 20 species but there were certainly about six species in there and this picture on the bottom here of this wasp with the long of positive was one I took of one of these little wasps that I found that emerged from the um the, the Bergar Gaul. So it's um, it is amazing little kind of ecological world all within its this little tiny exterior, this little blob that you see um, contains all of this amazing life. So let's change on to um, another tree species. Um, this is a very strange Gaul that affects both black poplar uh, and the hybrid black poplars and Lombardy poplar, which itself is a hybrid. And this time it affects the, the leaf stalk, but the base of the leaf. And it, it looks like somebody's tied a knot in the, in the leaf stalk. It has this kind of spiral growth. Um, and sometimes you can find a lot of them on a, on a tree. Um, so this one's caused actually by, by an aphid, not by a wasp. 
And so if you cut that open, you can often find the, uh, the young aphids inside. Now, this one is really common on ash trees. Uh, you're almost, we're almost guaranteed to find this uh, on Saturday or if you're out walking on your own, go look closely at the leaves of an ash tree. Um, when the gall is matured, it kind of rolls over the edge of the leaf and it takes on this kind of red uh, stripy uh, coloration. Actually, because of the drought we've had, a lot of the leaves have, uh, have, have dried up and so the red color has often been lost. The gall is still there, but it's all turned brown and, and dried out. Um, this one's caused by one of these psyllid bugs, uh, as you can see there on the right, and the young of the psyllid uh, are inside that roll of leaf. So this is a, a lime tree, the leaves of a lime tree. Um, and th these galls are called uh, nail galls. You can see why little um, kind of conical protuberances out of the leaf. You get nail galls on, on other plants as well, on some of the, um, the maples as well. Uh, both sycamore, field maple, Norway maple all have their own uh, nail galls. And these are also caused by mites and uh, a bit like the, the the blisters we saw on the on the blackthorn, it's a it's a cavity uh, with a hole into the cavity on the underside of the leaf, so the, the 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 little tiny mites can kind of come in and out of that cavity as they see fit, and the the gall keeps on growing. So um, at this time of year, they're, they're normally pretty obvious, um, but uh, by, before the the leaves fall, they can get you know up to a nearly a centimetre long. They start off green yellow and become quite red, almost kind of purpley red as they mature. This is one that you, you may have seen on, uh, on willow leaves, particularly on, on crack willow. Crack willow is a tree that's very common along waterways. And uh, they, they're often referred to as bean galls. They look like well, they start off red, well, start off green, sorry, then they turn red. And then as they age, they kind of go kind of a, a, a brown, discolored color. Um, so if you see one that's that's bright red, it's kind of in its prime, really. And these are caused by sawflies. Um, sawflies are related to bees and wasps. Uh, they are, the, if you like, the, the original uh, bees and wasps, bee and wasps, that in terms of evolutionary terms, they They've been around for, for a long time. The bees and wasps that we know of now have evolved from a, a kind of a sawfly ancestor many millions of years ago. So within each of these, these little bean and gall capsules, there is a larva, such as the one on the right, that uh, will hatch out, obviously, into an adult. The adult will go off and, um, and, and in, in the spring uh, will, will hatch out uh, from the fallen leaf in, and then in the spring, we'll go and find the fresh leaf to lay its eggs on. Interestingly with the willows, there's lots of different willows and um, there are other bean galls on other willow species, but they are caused by different species of sawfly. And I think there's about six different sawfly species that cause galls on willows, but each one is very specific to a type of willow. So it just, illustrates this specialism, this kind of chemical pairing between the uh, the chemicals that the insect is able to produce and the effect that it has on the plant. It doesn't work on all plants, only on a very specific one or a very small number of them. So this is one of my favorites actually, <laughs> um, the, the older tongue. Um, it does look like um, somebody sticking their tongue out at the end of the, the alder cones. So it's uh, a bit like the gall, if you like, that affects the acorn. This is the uh, equivalent. It affects the, the fruiting body of the tree. And it, it causes the, uh, the tissue to, to kind of spill out in this, in this tongue-like shape. It starts off um, kind of very pale and quickly turns red. And then um, it loses its color and kind of goes blacky brown as the, as the year goes on. The, um, as a result, the, the cone doesn't develop properly. And, uh, and so it, 
it will often stay on the tree, as indeed actually many cones do on alder. So you can find these um, these alder tones, uh, all the dried up versions, well into the uh, into the winter if you look for them. So let's have a, a quick look at galls that you can find on non trees. Uh, it's just a couple of examples. These are quite common ones. You can find galls on nearly every species of, of plant, by the way. Some of them are quite hard to see, um, but some of them are very obvious. And this is a, a good example. This is goosegrass or cleavers, as you may know it. And um, this time of year, you know, it's often growing in verges, bases of hedgerows. And if you see this kind of like this kind of pale green, kind of curly, whirly uh, growth pattern on the top of it, uh, then you found the gall. This one, again, is another gall caused by a mite causes the kind of swelling and twisting of the, uh, the, the, the terminal leaf leaflets of the of the plant. And, and you can see in the picture on the left, it can affect quite a big area, <clears throat> lots of plants together. And so it's not just an isolated example. So pretty obvious when that happens. And, uh, and perhaps finally, uh, another one uh, that is fairly obvious, this is a um, uh, a gall of creeping thistle. And the gall itself causes a swelling of the stem. And um, they're, they're relatively common, fairly easy to see. And this is actually one of the few examples where the gall causa, which is a fly, one of the fruit flies, um, is, is relatively easy to see. It's still not big. Um, it's only about five millimeters long, but it's very strikingly, strikingly colored uh, and patterned, as you can see in the picture there. So occasionally you'll see, uh, if you look closely at thistles at the right time of year, you'll see the flies um, crawling around, uh, particularly the males looking for females. Um, so they will mate on the plant, the female will lay her eggs um, on or into the stem. Um, together with the chemical and, and the swelling occurs. And then if you were to break open the swelling, uh, you'll find the larva of the fly, uh, the maggots, if you like, inside. And this time you can find quite a lot in the same gall. Um, there might be you know, a few dozen in, in, that, in that same gall. So hopefully I've just given you uh, a bit of an introduction to galls. Um, I think they're pretty amazing. Some people just specialize their, their wildlife interest in galls. They, they even have a name, or the, the, the study of galls has a name, it's called sessidology. So you can become a sessidologist. Um, I'd certainly, if you're interested, I recommend uh, getting that book that I showed at the beginning, the Wild Guides book. Um, it's, uh, it's about 10 quid or so. Uh, it's a great guide, it's quite small, you can carry it around with you. And all of these goals that we've looked at and many, many more that you'll come across uh, are in that book, a photographic guide to them. And it, they're all organized by plant. So if you find a plant that um, and you want to know what kind of goals to look for, sometimes it's good to to know what to look for. Otherwise, you're just kind of looking randomly at, at, at the wrong parts of the plant. But uh, I hope it gives you a bit more of a pointer to go. So look for, for these kind of things when you're out on, on a walk. And, and if you do find them, do record them on Nature Spot because it's uh, it, it's important that we kind of build up a, a picture of, of what's going on with, with Leicestershire and Rutland wildlife. I mentioned some of these are fairly recent introductions and there are new ones being found all the time. Um, some of them becoming rarer, some of them becoming commoner. And um, it's all part of the, you know, the, the, the ecosystem at large. All of these species are either predators or food for, for other creatures in, in the food chain. You all play their part. So any questions from you guys? Uh, Dave, can I ask you a question? Sure, fire away. Um, you know, when you mentioned that you kept the um, Bedigar, I can't say the rose gall. Bedigar. <laughs> Bedigar gall. Um, uh, presumably it's not a sealed jar because otherwise they wouldn't survive. Well, they didn't survive as it happened. <laughs> um, that, that, I just put it in a jam jar and it did have a lid on it. Um, but unless, 
unless you are there on the day that they hatch out, they probably wouldn't survive anyway. But that they'll yeah. survive inside the gall, even if you've got a little yes. jar. You don't have you don't have to put yes. muslin or something on top. Uh, no, I didn't. I, I just put the lid on. Uh, to be fair, I can't remember. I may not have put the lid on very tight. It might not have been um, airtight. So it uh -huh. probably would be a good idea maybe just to allow a little bit of air in there. But um, quite a lot of these kind of gall species, they, they carry on growing and developing even when the leaf or the fruit or whatever part of the plant that has got the gall on has fallen off the tree. So yes. taking the gall and putting it in a pot is no different to what would happen really if it fell onto the ground. Yeah. It's not it's Thank not you. it's not connected to the plant anymore. You can do this with other galls and try and hatch them out. Uh, you know, some uh, will work, some won't. But it's a it's a fun little experiment to try. Well, I discovered some wasps in my um, study unintentionally. They must have hatched out from something, but I don't know what they hatched out from. <laughs> yeah yeah well we'd have to search your study to see the source <laughs> i mean a lot of um uh, hymenoptera you know bees and wasps um and sawflies for that matter um do lay their eggs in wood um not they don't necessarily form galls but they will lay their eggs in uh, into holes in wood so um it's possible if you brought some wood into your you know you found out i think these probably came for some from some tree seeds because i've been given yeah. some okay. various tree seeds and i think that's yeah. probably what where they came from that's 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 quite possible certainly but because i didn't collect the, the seeds i i may not be able to you know know which which tree they were seeds of if you see what i mean no i mean and, they, and they're hard to identify as well many of these wasps partly because they're, they're tiny but there's quite a few and they look very similar. So knowing the host plant that they've come from is a really strong clue to help you identify uh, what what type of wasp, what, what species it is. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, well, yeah. thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna stop the recording.